we had Rex Chapman on last hour, and I said, hey, we got Jim Jackson coming on in the final hour. He goes, yeah, I think Jim put 50 on me. <laughs> so uh, Jim was on the call for Game 7 between the Hawks and 76ers on Sunday night, and uh, Jim joins us now. Do you remember putting 50 up on Rex Chapman, Jim? Uh, not quite 50, maybe 44. <laughs> oh, so so you remember exactly well, 44. <laughs> well, you know what? I don't I don't know if he was a Rex might have been on that. It was a that's when they were the Washington Bullets. Okay, when we were and we played them. Actually, it was it's ironic. Dan, it's the night before I you know, tore my ankle up when we went to Jersey. But I think Rex was on that Washington team uh, when that went down a little bit. Was Just he, a little bit. Was he guarding you? Evidently not. I mean. <laughs> now, Rex said that he looked forward to facing Vinny Del Negro because he knew he'd probably have a little easier night. Who did you? Oh, oh yeah. Who did you look forward to? Where you just went? Oh, I got to circle that on the calendar. Uh, you know, you know I'm, I'm be honest with you, man. It was during that time I had the ball so much it really didn't matter because I was always going to have the ball. Um, now I had. It was tough two guards at the time to play against. Rex was one of them, Mitch Richmond, Reggie Miller. Michael was out of the league right when I got in because he retired. Um, Clyde Drexler. It wasn't. It never was an easy night, I would say, in the league at that time because, Dan, if you, re- if you remember, centers, two guards, and probably power forwards were your meat of your um, team. So it was never – guarding Rex was hard because Rex ran off a lot of screens at chase him around the whole night. You know, that was extremely difficult. How would your game be now if you were playing? It's a great question. You know what? It'd be totally different. I, you know, Alonzo Mourning, right? Good friend of mine, right? He said, Jimmy, you know, if I played in this era, you know, I would dominate. I would do it. I said, no, you wouldn't. He said, what do you mean? I said, because not that you couldn't, you wouldn't be talented. I said, but at the age of 11 and 12, you wouldn't be posted up on the block. You would be pick and pop, three-point shooter, handling the ball, so you'll be a totally different player. And I would be a totally different player because I was a post-up um, guard that, that stayed in the paint, mid-range. I got my three-point ball later after my injury, but I would be a totally different player just based upon how kids grew up and played the game than I was when I played. Rex Chapman brought up the comparison to Ben Simmons, and he said, Jason Kidd, because Jason, through most of his career, wasn't a good shooter didn't want to take the shot. And Rex said that they would get mad at him and say, you got to at least take shots. So we're not double team when we, you know, we come off a pick, your man is mm-hmm. going to double team us. And, you know, I know we're all trying to be therapist here and uh psychiatrist with, with Ben Simmons. I, I don't know if this is a simple fix, Jim, what, what would yeah. you do if, if Ben is, if you took him under your wing? You know, first, I mean, that's a great comparison with Jay Kidd. I didn't think about that. But the difference with Jason, Jason wasn't afraid to attack and still get to the basket, even though he struggled sometimes at the free throw line early on. Jay would never shy back away from attacking and then still making a play. Ben would not. Now, we had to employ Jason to shoot, too, early in his career. But that turned out to be great for him. I mean, later on. And, Dan, it's hard to get into somebody's mind. You've been around the game, games and professional sports enough to know that until a person wants to seek help, you can't help them, okay? If you're still telling yourself in the mirror and you look at yourself and say, I really don't need help, I can solve it, then there's nothing that advice we can do. Look, entertain, entertainer have it when they have stage fright, okay? People who are public speaking, okay? They can be great in front of a small audience, but get them into a bigger audience and, and more people, they don't perform as well. So it's not just a sports thing, it's a psyche thing. And until that, individual says I need and will accept some kind of help it's really nothing you can do about it but can you change his form like at this age he's going to be 25 in a couple of weeks can you but, but it's not but he has good form that's the that's the killer part Dan it's not like he goes up there and he has a hitch in his shot okay but he has good form but it's like this it's a guy that goes and puts in the work Ben Simmons works on his game people say well he should go and work shoot all these free throws. He does that. I, Sam Cassell, we were going out to dinner in Philadelphia um, during the, uh, it was game two. He's like, I can't go. I got to go to the gym with Ben at seven o'clock at night and shoot free throw. 
It's not that he doesn't work on it. Not that his form is not there. It's that when he gets in the game and doesn't have immediate, this is just me, immediate results, all of that goes out the window. All of that work you put in is left on the practice court. And that's the difference. Look at Markel Fultz now. Remember the tr- struggles Markel Fultz had in Philadelphia. Sometimes maybe a change of zip code helps. Markel Fultz got out of Philly, and now his game has trended upward. Mm-hmm. Mentally, he's in a better place. And I'm not blaming it all on Philly, but sometimes you need to be removed out of a situation that's not as comfortable in order for you to get out of the uncomfortable situation you're in. Yeah, I maintain that if you do trade him, you're not going to get dollar for dollar. But no. but mm-hmm. maybe he goes to a team that doesn't have the expectations the 76ers had. When Joel mm-hmm. Embiid is out of there, Jim, he Ben is Ben feels like looks like plays like a different player. Oh yeah, so, oh totally different. Right? I mean, he he attacks differently, I, and I don't know too is if it's one of those things, Dan, where he's comfortable being Robin. You know, with Joel Embiid, the yeah. pressure is more on Embiid, but he doesn't understand the pressure is on him too. But when, you, you made a point, and I said this, you know, before, when Embiid is out, I mean out like DNP is going to be out a few games, Ben's game is totally different. His mentality is totally different. So which tells us that if he's in a situation maybe in another franchise, that's the maybe the mentality that he has, you know, 90, 95% of the time that he's on the court. I got more concerns with the Greek freak than I do Ben Simmons at the line. The Greek Why? freak can't pull the trigger. He shoots air balls. He doesn't have good form. I That's a bigger concern, but but he's a better yeah. player than Ben. And and we sort of whitewash the other stuff. I, I'm, he, he's one of the best players in the game. He's shooting air balls, Jim, from the free throw line. Yeah, but you, but you know what, though? Let me say this. Carl Malone came into the league and he was like in the mid forties free throw shooter. Yeah. Ended up probably over his career in the mid seventies. Yeah. Tim Duncan wasn't a great free throw shooter coming into the league, but they worked on it. The thing I love about Greek is this, where you can get on him about shooting the threes. You can get on about the free throws, but at least he's up there. He doesn't leave it on the practice court. Like Ben does at times. He's not afraid to go and get fouled. Okay. Guys feed off of that on your team. Keep, think about that too. There's some guys that shot air balls before that are great free throw shoot. Now, maybe not as many as Giannis has in his career, but I'm not mad at Giannis because at least Giannis has the confidence to take the shot, to get to the basket in late game situations at times um, and not afraid to be at the free throw line. I think he will become a better free throw shooter, meaning, you know, low 70s. I think he will because he works at it. He believes, more importantly, Dan, he believes that he can become a better free throw shooter. We're talking to Jim Jackson, Fox and Turner Sports NBA analyst. He was on the call game seven Hawks in the 76ers on Sunday night. We've been talking about this name, image and likeness for college athletes. uh, Yeah, that that's it's it's happening. It's coming our way. But imagine you're going into college at Ohio State. You were a big deal. You know, you you could have cashed in probably Mm -hmm. uh, big time, right? Locally. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? And it's. It's about time, but and we got to keep in mind too. It's not like every player benefits the same because it's really, you know, your most popular players are the ones going to sell a lot of jerseys. If you're you're in a 52 man roster, 55 man roster in football. I mean, but you got to have maybe five or six guys that really benefit from it. I mean, big time benefit that that the university pumps up. But still, it's something. Now, I know a lot of coaches are, you know, in, in between because it's a recruiting advantage in regards to some aspects. Some schools have a bigger alumni base, a bigger TV deal, a bigger this, and and they're going to use that to say, well, hey, you know, if you come to our university, endorsement-wise, you're able to pick up X amount of dollars, which is true, but it's still to the benefit of the the student-athlete, whether that's male or female. Uh, Rex said that he was offered $500,000 annuity, that that his – his, uh, they were going to put it in escrow. A school, he didn't say who it was, but he said that he was offered that through his parents. Mm-hmm. What was the biggest offer you got? Right. Uh, Tommy's Pizza. 
<laughs> Tommy's Pizza, bro. Wait, you didn't, get, you, you didn't get anything. No. You were a big deal. No, no. If somebody got something, yeah, but I didn't, if somebody, but we didn't play that. When I came out of my parents in the group that I was with coming out of high school, we just didn't go down that road. We just, we never did. My father was one like this. Look, if you take something from somebody, that means you owe them something. So I you know, think of something, Dan. I worked all the way through high school. I was a caddy. I, I uh, cleaned cars. I worked at uh, my, my grade school, mopping floors, waxing floors. Always had a job. When I was in college for two years, I worked at Dean Witter in the summer for two years. And I, and I sold furniture at Value City my junior year in the summer. <laughs> Imagine me coming up saying, okay, you want to get some Scotch guard for your sofa so I can upsell, so I can upsell you. <laughs> To get more money, okay? No, let me tell you a story, Dad. It was summertime in July, a tent sale outside on Morris Road. Hot as all hell get out. And I'm out there trying to sell a sofa, okay? But it's because my father and my parents taught me that it's you. You go get it. You don't have to owe anybody anything. So I feel good about myself getting that measly check that I didn't have to worry about looking over my shoulder because I didn't take anything from anybody. Now I got some free food, you know, people would take care of me and do that kind of stuff. But as far as like greenbacks, no, nah, bro. Mm-mm. Were you any good at selling furniture? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you what, it's a competitive business, bro, because, <laughs> hey, you notice like it, when people walk in the door, it's a salesperson that jumps up on you real quick. Yeah. That's because you got a, a percentage of sale. You weren't on salary, bro. You had to sell. You had to kill what you eat, okay? And, man, they saw me in there. They was like, I don't care. This young kid is not taking my business away. It was tough, bro. <laughs> yeah, but you had an advantage. You were a big deal. You were a name. Hey, let me tell you something. The looks I got from some of those salesmen, <laughs> all right? I'm telling you, bro, They they were... Listen, I was there temporarily. That was their livelihood. Oh, yeah. You think they were going to let me outshine them just because I was Jimmy Jackson? No, bro. No, it wasn't happening. It was a great experience, though. Uh, Do you think Kawhi Leonard plays in this series? I hope he does. But, you know, it's it's interesting because, you know, I cover the Clippers all year. So they're kind of keeping quiet kind of what the extent of the injury is. And if they feel that they can get away, which you know how it is, Dan, a couple of games they can win in Phoenix. And now the home court shifts back to the Clips. They go home. Maybe they split it. Still gives Kawhi time enough to get back instead of rushing it. I mean, Paul George has been phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, I'm un- unbelievable. I'm so I'm so happy for him now. The story is not written. The story, the chapter is not closed. But all year, Dan, I've been saying that Paul has just been focused. He hasn't said a lot. He's letting his game do his talking. And right now he's stepping up big time, man. Yeah, I don't know if Kawhi plays. I know. I I know. I I really don't. Like, you know, I expect Chris Paul back, you know, probably when the series goes back to LA, he's quarantining in Los Angeles and and would probably be able to come back. But without Kawhi. You you know what's crazy, Dan? You know what's crazy is that people talk about the injuries, right? The injuries, we were doing a thing on it that the number of injuries are not that much higher or lower than the normal year. It's just marquee names. It's just the marquee names right now that's drawing all the attention. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's, it's tough for the league, too, because you, you want your guys, your key guys playing at the end of the year, and injuries are all a part of it. But it's just unfortunate that we had the rash of marquee injuries in the playoffs to Anthony Davis, to Murray's, you know, now to Kawhi, you know, stuff like that. That you call, I mean, you know, with Harden going out and what, what, what that Brooklyn team with Kyrie, you know, that totally changes the narrative of, of the playoffs, you know, and it's tough like that, man. It really is. Have you seen somebody play better than Kevin Durant? Um, that's a great question, man. It's because there's been some great performances. I mean, Booker's playing awesome right now, Devin Booker. But it's something different about Kevin Durant, man. You know, he, here's the thing: I think you, you got to take and look at Kevin, like Steph. Okay, and this is what is like Steph. They really don't need the ball in their hands 85 percent to be effective. Because you can move them around the board like a chess piece. That's why they're so difficult to guard, Dan. Because with Steph, you, he can throw, give the ball up and run off 18,000 screens and get open. Same thing with KD. 
So that makes it more difficult for the defense to lock in because if you're just throwing it to him in one spot or he's just bringing it up, the defense can shift and set. And that kind of can take away some things. But when you can move them around the court like that, how many players have we seen like that that have been this effective at 6'11", really seven feet, okay, that, that does that? Nobody. I mean, if I'm, I, I was sitting there at all watching it. You know, and the question was, could he be effective enough without the other two to, to make his team competitive? I think he answered that question. I don't understand. It, help me understand this. This drives okay. me crazy. When you have – everybody knows Kevin Durant's getting the ball. There's six seconds right. to go. <laughs> and and they have P.J. Tucker on him. So you don't right. even have somebody flash on him. You don't, you don't have – you know, Holiday has a chance to go up there. I, I got to get the ball out of the Stars' hands. Yeah. Like, I go back to the Utah Jazz against the Bulls and Michael Jordan. They didn't double-team him. Like, I, I know. I mean – I, I know, I was, especially especially at a time too when three point shot wasn't as viable. Okay, but put him in the middle of the court almost. It's a tougher double team because you got more option. So I know, man. It, it is especially with that Brooklyn team when Kyrie and you know James are not there. It's like when you play against Golden State without Clay on the court, it's a lot easier to double team. Steph, but yet teams didn't really do it a lot early, it's, it's you know, to get the crazy. ball out of his hand. I, I don't want the best player to beat me. If if the if the third no. guy beats uh, me, then I, I live with that. If you said Joe Harris hits a yeah. jumper and we lose, okay. All right, but yeah. I'm I'm not letting KD hit 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 a jumper. I'm not. Yeah. And and you know what? Yeah. If a couple inches, then we're talking about, you know, the Bucks folding, probably their head coach gets fired. The Nets, maybe yeah. they get healthy and they win a champion. I mean, it's that close, and they almost allowed that to happen. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. And you got to scratch your head sometimes. You think about it too: is that somebody else is going to have to get the ball? It's just like what was a game. I don't know. Was it two or in Brooklyn when Milwaukee wouldn't allow KD to get the ball or Kyrie, and it was Bruce Brown who had yeah. to try to finish the shot, and somebody so. That right there in itself is what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, you know what it's like when they'd play a boxing one on us in high school. You know, I had on that. us. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And we, I, we, we can speak French. We, because we went through it before. But I, we I, understand it. I, I hate it. I, <laughs> I, I would yell at the defense. I'd say, "You're afraid to guard me. You're afraid to go play that boxing one nonsense." So, let me ask you a question though: When they played the boxing one or try going two on you. You still with money, right? No, I had to be a decoy. I had a coach who said, get the ball inside, Danny. Get the ball inside. So he I, made me to revisit your, your coach, man. Is he is he still walking and breathing? I don't know where he is. I don't <laughs> know. No I'm over it, Jim. I'm finally I, over I it. Can I can tell. I'm finally. Like your, body, your body language says it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you with furniture sales. Mm. You know, you're over it, right? Yeah, kind of. I'm, I'm still a little scarred, man. The the tent sale got me. Everything else was fine. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Here's here's Jim Jackson saying, "You want you want to scotch guard that? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> honey, it's Jim Jackson. He says yeah. they bring a scotch guard this. Yeah, yeah, that'll you know, take got, care of it. You, I said you got kids, right? You never know spillage. <laughs> you, know, you know what's spillage? <laughs> Always great to connect with you, Jim. Thank you, buddy. Come on, man. I'm, I'm here, buddy. All right. That's uh, Jim Jackson, Fox and Turner Sports NBA analyst. He's uh, the Clippers analyst, 14-year NBA vet. Take a break. Close up shop. Last call for phone calls. What we learn right after this. 